And I have a very short two questions. Uh, have we gone too much into the postmodern era and made it impossible to theorize? That would be my first question. We social scientists are kind of losing our way in terms of knowing what really theorizing means, because the way the hard sciences theorize and the way we now seem to theorize seem to be going in two different ways. Would you maybe like to uh, comment a little bit as to where you see the role of science and technology in IR and the theorizing of IR? Thank you very much. There are a lot of points here. Uh, first of all, your point about general applicability, I agree completely uh, that theories should apply uh, across the board, regardless of where they're developed. In other words, if a Turkish scholar had developed a powerful theory of realism, a new theory of realism, that should apply widely. It shouldn't apply just to Turkey. Uh, so I, I think you and I are in agreement there. Uh, and uh, I think, by the way, that's one of the reasons why scholars in the non-Western world gravitate to these Western theories. It's because those Western theories apply broadly. As I said to you, just to personalize it, I find myself more at home in China and in Russia in terms of my theories than I do in the United States. I find Turkey to be a more friendly environment than I find the United States to be on this issue, right? And that just tells you that the theory travels. And this is why I said that I believe that if a homegrown theory, to use Owner and Ursel's rhetoric, if, if there was a homegrown theory in the non-Western world, it would travel, right? Because theories just travel because they're general statements that have, to use your rhetoric, which I'm sympathetic with, general uh, applicability. With regard to uh, our ability to talk to each other, I think there's no question that the field has become very fragmented uh, and that people don't talk to each other. Uh, I think if you look at um, IR scholarship in Europe and you look at IR scholarship in the United States, there's there are fundamental differences between those two worlds and they don't tend to talk with each other at all. Uh, and uh, so I, I think there is that fragmentation. I also think there's a lot of fragmentation inside the United States. Uh, you know, realists don't talk much to social constructivists, social constructivists don't talk much to realists. Uh, and with regard to methods, uh, I think what's happened is people who do methods don't talk much to people who do theory and vice versa. So there is, there is a lot of fragmentation uh, going on. Um, I just note to you that one thing that strikes me about a lot of scholarship in IR in the, uh, in let's call it the Western world versus the non-Western world, uh, is I think that in the Western world, there's not that much interest in engaging with the policy world. Uh, and it's considered to be a bad thing if you engage with the policy world. Whereas I find in the non-Western world, IR scholars are much more interested in how scholarship fits with what's going on in the real world. And this brings me back to a point that Ursel was making. Ursel was saying that IR theory is more popular outside of the West than it is inside the West. I agree with him. OK, the reason I think that IR theory is more popular in the non-Western world is because non-Western scholars are more interested in the real world. You do not want to underestimate the extent to which a Western, certainly an American scholar, will be looked down upon if he or she is deeply involved with policy issues. Right. 
you don't want to go too near the policy world, right? Academics tend to think the policy world and the academic world are two separate worlds. I believe, and this is going to sound funny, but I believe that if you do IR theory, you're much more interested in the real world than you are if you do methods. Methods is less oriented towards real world policy issues than theory is. Uh, so I don't find that uh, surprising at all. Uh, your point about it's become impossible to theorize. Uh, I don't think it's become impossible to theorize. My point was it's become more difficult to theorize uh, in large part because I think a lot of uh, a lot of the theoretical space has been taken up. Uh, that's one way I would put it. Uh, again, I want to make it clear there's still room out there for lots of work, but not as much as there was it, certainly in 1945 or even in 1975. With regard to your point about the role of science uh, and technology, uh, you could theorize about science and technology in all sorts of ways. Uh, and uh, I've often thought that a really good uh, subject to theorize about would be the evolution of technology and how it's affected IR. And I've thought that you could focus on information technologies and how information technologies affect IR. You could focus on how uh, destructive technologies like nuclear weapons and so forth and so on affect war. Uh, if you're interested in conventional deterrence, right, which is what I started working on way back when, uh, my work on conventional deterrence was all about Europe and the Central Front, because that's what mattered. The whole subject of conventional deterrence and how it relates to East Asia today is very different, right? The war that you worried about in Central Europe is very different than the war you worry about in East Asia in the future between the United States and China. So how does conventional deterrence relate to East Asia? This is a really very interesting question. And that's when technology comes into play. Technology really matters. And by the way, in terms of technology, these Turkish drones that the Ukrainians are using, these Turkish drones that the Azerbaijanis were using against the Armenians, the whole subject of drones, uh, I think you could do some very interesting middle range theoretical work on drones. So I think there are a lot of, you know, interesting subjects related to technology and to science. And by the way, from an American point of view, or at least from my point of view, one of the things that really, really matters is the ongoing technological race between the United States and China. You, you understand that the Chinese are trying to run us off the board at the technological level. There's an arms race taking place in terms of sophisticated technologies, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, 5G, on and on, right? We're in trouble, right? The United States is in trouble. We are up against a really impressive country. They want to run Silicon Valley off the table. And we are trying to rise to the occasion. So you're going to have this competition in high end technologies take place over the next, God knows how many decades, right? The United States and China competing, right? And uh, all sorts of interesting things could be said there uh, as well. So I think the role of science and technology, lots of opportunities there. Uh, and uh, and hopefully people, hopefully you will theorize on this on this set of subjects.